Yod, and I want to thank you so much for taking the time to join us for another great webinar. Tonight, we are joined by the former director of the National Endowment for the Humanities, Humanities is We the People Initiative, the current distinguished fellow for Next Generation Texas with Texas Public Policy Foundation, an author, a scholar, and oh, by the way, an Article 5 simulation commissioner from the great state of Texas, none other than Dr. Thomas Lindsay. Dr. Lindsay, how are you doing this evening? I am doing well, Jonathan. Thank you very much for having me back. We really, really appreciate you being here. So folks, before we get started, uh, for those of you who are new, I'd like to take a minute to welcome you and thank you so much for joining us and for coming on to learn more about Convention of States. If you're not familiar with COS and you're brand new, we're a grassroots movement focused on the goal of utilizing Article 5 of the US Constitution to call a convention of states in order to propose amendments to the Constitution that would reduce the size and scope of the federal government, impose fiscal restraints on the federal government, and place term limits on all members of Congress and federal officials. In order to hold such a convention, we need 34 states to pass our resolution. And to date, we have 19 states that have done so. There's some technicality there. We do have 20. I would just say the 20th state doesn't know it yet, but 19 officially. Uh, so we're super happy to have you tonight. And once again, welcome to uh, the program. Also, we have our team in the background answering questions, so please feel free to ask away in the chat. Uh, however, I do ask that you please keep your questions focused on tonight's conversation with Dr. Lindsay and Convention of States generally. We'll get to as many questions as we possibly can, but the number one question that we get is, is this being recorded? And the answer is yes, we are recording this, and we are also streaming on our social media sites as well, so you will be able to see this if you have to duck out early we will have the full recording that we will be sending to you. We also have available a number of handouts that you can download if you're on joining us on the webinar. We've got the COS FAQ document, so it can answer some of the frequently asked questions that you may have. Uh, we also have the digital pocket guide available. We also have some unique things, particularly relating to tonight's discussion, including an article written by Dr. Lindsay, uh, we'll get into that a little bit more later on in the program. Uh, we also have the proposals that came out of the Convention of States Foundation simulated convention that you can download. And you can also download our conventional disinformation article, which addresses the opposition uh, and something that's very useful to our activists. Uh, so please go right ahead and download those if you'd like. Lastly, uh, we have some new swag in the Article 5 Outfitters store. Um, that's otherwise known as the Convention of States store. I'm wearing one of our new t-shirts uh, that are that is now available in the store. And I've also been told that there is a major discount right now on drinkware. And we still have some of the uh, 10th anniversary tumblers still available in the store. And we also have the Tastes Like Freedom whiskey mug available. The only downside is you will have to buy your whiskey separately. Okay. Otherwise, we've got a lot of great stuff over at the store. So go on over to shop conventionofstates.com uh, when you get a chance and, and see what, what great stuff we've got available for all of you. The last thing I will note is uh, usually I tease that our next guest uh, for the next COS at Home webinar, and I tell you to stick around to the end. I will let you know we haven't gotten our guest just yet. We're working on that, uh, and we will be releasing that, but we will be dropping the link in the chat so that this way you can go ahead and register for the November COS at Home. Okay. Without further ado, Dr. Lindsay, I want to thank you again for being here with us this evening. Uh, I'm really excited for this conversation with you. But first, as a new guest to COS at Home, I was wondering if you could share with us your COS story. When did you first learn about Article 5 and why do you believe it is the solution to the issues our country is currently facing? Yeah, uh, thank you, Jonathan. And as I mentioned to you before we went live, uh, I'm a PhD in political science, and I'm ashamed to say that it was only in the last 10 years that I realized the importance of this provision, which is in the original Constitution, thanks to George Mason. And as I looked at efforts, various efforts across the country to rein in the size of the federal government, um, to try to put limit their jurisdiction, uh, limit their terms, it seemed like we were beating our heads against the wall with no effect. But again, thanks to George Mason, 
we have a constitutional means to do this. And when I learned that, then I thought, well, this has never happened in history and maybe it's impossible. But further research showed me that for convention of states to win, it doesn't have to win. And by that, I mean this, if you look at in the, uh, I think it was 1913 when the states, it was either the 16th or the 17th amendments, you had 31 states. Back then you only needed 32 to call a convention. You had 31, one away from two thirds. And suddenly Congress said, oh my goodness, we can't let the states realize this power they have under the constitution. So Congress took it over and uh, declared victory. Uh, so you don't have to win to win. And that was something that gave me more faith in its practical feasibility. Uh, in fact, uh, when asked about it, my goodness, this was back about 30 years ago, uh, Antonin Scalia, uh, 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 former Supreme Court justice who's passed away, they asked him, well, what should be the first uh, uh, subject to be addressed at an amendments convention? He said, that's, he said, that's not so important. And they said, what do you mean that's not so important? And he said, look, I'm not saying I'm in favor of some crazy amendment coming out. But he said, but what I am in favor of is once this happens, once they hit that critical threshold, he said, you watch the courts and you watch the administrative bodies sit up and start to notice. And I pray that that's what happens. Amen, amen. So although I'm sure we have plenty of Texans represented on the call tonight, there are many other folks from other states that are on the call as well, and they likely have not heard of Texas Public Policy Foundation. We did mention TPPF on our last call, uh, our last COS at Home webinar, I should say, with Dr. Kevin Roberts, your friend. Uh, but nevertheless, could you share with us what the organization stands for and tell us a little bit more about the main objectives or goals for TPPF? Yeah, I'd be happy to. Uh, the Texas Public Policy Foundation was established in 1989. Really, and its key issue then was universal school choice, along with uh, 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 tort reform. That was Dr. James Leiniger. That was part of his vision. And we have fought since 1989 to get school choice at the Texas Public Policy uh, Foundation passed. And as some of you may know right now, uh, Texas Governor Greg Abbott called a special session. A school, a school choice bill did pass the Senate. Another version passed the House. But then uh, politics got involved at the end of the session. You guys know all about that stuff. And the bill died. Uh, but fortunately, uh, the governor said, no, I'm bringing you back. Uh, we're going to get this. And uh, I think there will be something. I mean, I'm not, I'm not there. I'm not a prognosticator. I simply am a researcher in policy. But it certainly seems, as a matter of fact, uh, and this really is a moral parallel to our argument for the need to resuscitate the vitality of the states uh, in, our, in our governing system. <clears throat> I just, if you go to Texas Public Policy Foundation's website, uh, tomorrow I, I publish a piece that's going up tomorrow called, uh, what, would, what Would Thomas Hobbes Say About School Choice? And what I did was I addressed, uh, I addressed uh, uh, an argument the NEA, National Education Association, Public Teacher Union, uh, tweeted uh, last year that no one knows and loves students better than teachers. And I thought, including parents? Uh, and so the piece that I wrote looks at uh, the English uh, political philosopher Thomas Hobbes, who some people regard as the founder of modern political science, He's certainly the founder of the modern doctrines of human equality and inalienable rights. So he's very important for us. And uh, Hobbes said this, he said, he's trying to make the, he's making the argument for human equality and he's making it uh, with regard to human prudence. And he said, he says, 
A plain husbandman, meaning a simple farmer, is more prudent in the affairs of his own house than is the privy counselor in the affairs of another man. Now that argument parallels our argument for a convention of states, because what Hobbes, I mean, look, let's, let's take, we'll just accept the argument that professional educators know better than the average parent and that uh, bureaucrats in DC know better than the average person. That doesn't settle the argument for Hobbes because he doesn't say that the plain farmer is more prudent in all affairs. He says in the affairs of his own house than is the privy counselor in the affairs of another man. I mean, that's part of the argument we use for restoring the power to the states. It's the same thing, bringing it down to the level where the combination of motivation and knowledge is best. And that's the reason for federalism. And that's also the reason that we want parents to be able to make choices for their own education. Absolutely. And I'm going to shift gears up. I was going to come back to the, the special section later, but since we're on it, let's talk about it a little bit. Um, but first, what is your, you, uh, I realize you work with the Next Generation Texas campaign for TPPF. Could you describe to us a little bit more about that initiative? I think that fits in with what you've been talking about so far. Yeah. Uh, I mean, we chose that title uh, after a lot of consideration because I'm not telling any of you what you anything you don't know. We're always there's a big debate about education, and there has been. Uh, and we often end up talking past each other. It makes things clearer, I think, if instead of saying education, we replace that with our future. There's a saying uh, attributed to Lincoln, but I've never been able to track it down. But it's a great saying anyway, so I'll I'll share it. And that is this. Lincoln said, the philosophy taught in the classroom in this generation will be the philosophy practiced in the legislature in the next generation. So next generation Texas got its name for that reason, because what we're fighting for is our future. And uh, we have been fighting, uh, we were, uh, we supported and testified in favor of a bill that's just successfully passed in May, and that was the ban on diversity, equity, and inclusion at all Texas public, in training programs, you can't touch teacher, what teachers say in the classroom, but you can eliminate the training and programs and staff. And we also uh, supported and testified in favor of a bill that passed in 21 that banned critical race theory and action civics in the Texas K-12 curriculum. So education has always been a, a really a key focus of the Texas Public Policy Foundation. Absolutely, and as you mentioned, you know, during the session, Governor Abbott, um, uh, during regular session, wanted to get something done, wasn't able to get it done. So we've got that special session going on right now with school choice being a prominent one. And Senate Bill One um, is one is, is a bill that just passed the Senate. Uh, it's something that's supported by Texas Public Policy Foundation, also supported by Convention of States. And it establishes education savings accounts. And I'm sure many people have heard about these types of accounts before, but could you describe what they are and how they promote school, school choice and also empower parents? Yeah, and I'm, and I'm glad you asked that because while I'm not involved in the uh, K-12 uh, uh, school choice uh, center, I do know and can tell you that if you read anything about this debate, and the article uses the word vouchers instead of instead of ESAs, it's a biased report. Uh, because the argument against school choice is that this will rob our public schools of needed resources and uh, they will fail. Well, they're already failing, that we know. And second, not to, you know, this is not a nyanya kind of, uh, attitude toward the public schools, quite the contrary. In the states where school choice has gone universal or near universal, what the happy news is that the public schools get better as a result, which of course we know because we know that competition makes everybody better. 
So ESAs, contrary to what you hear in the mainstream media, you can use them for whatever purpose, private school, home school, supplementary materials. It's about parental freedom and empowerment in choosing the best education they can get for their kids, because we believe that parents know best what's good for their kids. Absolutely. Uh, absolutely. I think and that's why it's going to pass. That's why yes. I think we're going to get something. It'll be phased. It's how politics works, but we'll get something. And some folks who may be, may be joining us may be saying, well, what, why are we talking? If this is Convention of States, why are we talking about education? And to me, it gets right to the heart of being a self-governing citizen, right? You exactly. have to be educated on these issues if you're going to do your duty and uphold your your uh, portion of the process, right? The Constitution reads, we the people. So that means we need to be engaged in our government. And the way that we do that is we need to have an educated populace and let's face it, our education systems have been failing our citizens for a number of years so that this is a critically important piece of the puzzle. That's right. Uh, you know, and I, 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 was hap I was fortunate. I was liberated from where I grew up in Chicago and, and uh, uh, moved down to Texas. The Underground Railroad's going the opposite direction. Um, but you may have seen the, uh, and you in the audience may have seen, it's a documentary called Waiting for Superman. And it's just heartbreaking. You've got these minority kids who are dying to get in to a charter school, but it has been so limited in so many states that they've got no choice. Now look, rich people have school choice. They've always had it. All that the school choice movement is doing is trying to do the same thing for everybody. So it's another one of those political ironies that you see the opposition to it that you do. And, you know, um, Wendy Graham was the chairman of Texas Public Policy Foundation until she retired a few years ago. She's married to Phil Graham, a former Texas senator, a PhD economist, ran for president. One time he was on TV, and this really ties in with this argument that we're making in defense of returning power to the states. And Phil Graham was on TV debating some someone from the education establishment. And he said, I favor school choice because nobody loves my kids more than me. To which his, the education person said back to him, you're wrong, Senator. I love your, I'm an educator. I love your kids just as much as you do. And he said, you do? And she said, yes. And he said, good, tell me, what are their names? His point was the same point as Hobbes's point, and it shares a fundamental point with the Convention of States movement, and that is the principle of subsidiarity, that the lowest level know, has the most intimate knowledge and can best carry out the task. Parents and states. Very well said, sir. Very well said. So, folks, again, as I mentioned, Convention of States is supporting Senate Bill 1. So, if you are in Texas, and you're willing to help us out. We want to try to get this across the finish line. As I mentioned, it was passed in the Senate. We're now focusing on the House. And you, again, you might be saying, well, what convention of states? What, I thought only focusing on Article 5 and advancing that resolution. No, in states that have already passed our resolution, we are supporting what we have termed uh, F3 legislation. So that's legislation that promotes freedom, fundamental rights, and federalism. Those are the things that we're focused on because we want to advance uh, the culture and rebuild the culture of self-governance even at the state level. So states that have already passed our resolution are focused on this, including Texas. So if you are interested and you want to help out in your state and get more involved, go to conventionofstates.com, click on that Take Action tab, sign up to become a volunteer. We're extremely grateful for support from organizations like TPPF. And I also should point out there are other organizations like TPPF in this every just about every state in the country. So I'd encourage you Take a look at some of the organizations in your state. Take a look at, um, I think, State Policy Network, I think, is an organization that has it, all of these. Um, yeah, it's a network. That are, yes, a large network of these think tanks. Go and check out them in your own state so that this way you can learn more. You can work with them if you're in a convention of states team and advance some important legislation in your state. Um, but, Dr. Go right ahead, sir. Yeah. Uh, Jonathan, I just wanted to add to your point because it's excellent because you raised. And rightly so to the audience. Well, why are we talking about 
education, right? That's why we're talking about convention of states. Look, I can't say it any better than Thomas Jefferson. Jefferson said, any nation that expects to be both ignorant and free expects what never was and will never be. I can't say it better, right? And as I said, the quote attributed to Lincoln, that the philosophy taught in the classroom in this generation will be the philosophy taught, it will be the philosophy practice in the legislature in the next generation. Our democracy depends on education. Freedom's not a gift. It's gotta be earned and re-earned by every generation. And it's gotta be re-earned by being re-learned. And I think in a parallel point to this, with its connection with the Convention of States effort. Um, those who worry about a quote unquote runaway convention, blah, blah, or Congress will do stuff behind closed doors, they don't understand the extent and depth of intensity of the civic education that the Americans in those 34 states that make the call will have achieved, will be a different country at that point, right? So uh, it, we harm ourselves if we forget the essential aspect of education in this movement. Absolutely, absolutely. So Dr. Lindsay, if you don't mind, let's, let's shift back to Convention of States specifically. In fact, let's go back in time to when Texas was primed to pass our resolution. We hadn't done it yet. Back in 2016, Governor Greg Abbott endorsed Convention of States, released the Texas plan, which outlined what he believed Texas should focus on at an Article 5 convention. And at the same time, you wrote an article entitled, Who's Afraid of an Article 5 Convention? That's the one that we have available for people to download and they can read themselves. It was an incredible, incredible piece. And I, I've really enjoyed reading it uh, earlier this week in, in preparation for this interview. But I was curious, what inspired you to write that piece and what kind of reaction did you receive after it was published? Uh, well, what inspired, you know, as I say, I'm ashamed to say as a political scientist that I wasn't aware until I did serious research on this, on what, on the possibilities that an amendments convention uh, 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 promised. And as I got more into the uh, details of this and looking at all the uh, various uh, conventions that were held. Rob Nadelson's research on this is the best that's out there. Um, I realized that this may well be what Lincoln called the last best hope. This is a constitutional means of restricting the power. It's the only constitutional means left, right? Because as George Mason said, at the at in Philadelphia, I mean, they were all set. They had one means of amending the Constitution, and that was Congress. And then George Mason said, "Wait a second. Why should we expect Congress to propose amendments to limit the very power that they're abusing?" No less than Alexander Hamilton said, "You're right." And so they added this second method from the states. Absolutely. And thank God that they did, because this is yes. an opportunity for us. And this is the solution to solve the problems. And what I loved about your piece was you really took the time to dig into the history of Article 5 and other conventions in general in order to address the, the main concern, really. It really comes down, I think you outlined two in particular, but one that I focus on is is the potential for a runaway convention, right? That's the that's really kind of the 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 jumping off point, if you will, for all of the other arguments against us having a convention. And one part of our history that you discussed that I would bet many people watching on this call have not heard of before is the Washington Conference Convention, which took place in 1861. Could you share with everyone what that yeah. conference was all about and why some believe? it served as a rehearsal for an Article 5 convention. Oh, absolutely. I mean, you could, when you hear the year, when you heard Jonathan just say the year 1861, it's not too hard to figure what they <laughs> called the convention for, right? It was to try to 
head off the Civil War. Now, obviously, it didn't happen. But, and again, all credit to Rob Nadelson's research. I mean, he shows how not only this convention, but I think he tallies up 150 in colonial times uh, and then up through, uh, up through the founding, uh, including a call for a convention uh, for a Bill of Rights that ultimately didn't, it, it didn't succeed. It, well, it didn't win, but it won. We got in 1791, uh, uh, the first 10 amendments, which a hundred years later, we started calling uh, the Bill of Rights. So um, it's, uh, well, and let me address also this runaway convention because I hear this all the time. I read about it. It seems like every other week, our friends at uh, Eagle Forum, and John Burr Society, God bless them, but uh, they're wrong. Uh, first, an amendments convention, I mean, they compare an amendments, con they say that an amendments convention, it could be any issue and they could, you know, eliminate free speech. They're doing a good job of that already. Uh, eliminate the Second Amendment, et cetera. And, uh, but that's not true. Our Constitutional Convention in 1787 in Philadelphia was what was called a plenipotentiary convention. It's open to everything. An amendments convention is limited by the subjects for which you get at least two states to make a call. Now, and now to their second point, yeah, but what if things go crazy and they come out with nutty stuff? All right. Again, our founders and their wisdom provided it only takes 13 out of the 50 states to block any crazy proposed amendment. If, an, if a crazy amendment came out of it, only 13, if we don't have 13 states left that we can count on, then our experiment in self-government is over already, right? And then finally, this notion, these, the same argument that, that, that uh, puts out these boogeymen also says that in fact, our constitution in Philadelphia in 1787 was uh, a, a runaway convention. Now, two points on that, because political scientists have talked about this uh, ever since the founding. The charter that the Continental Congress gave this convention was, quote, to revise the articles of convention in order to better meet the exigencies of the union, the needs of the union. Okay, now, obviously, Constitution did a lot more than revise the article, it scrapped them. But the Federalists had the better argument because because the charter they were given said the means is revise the articles. The end or purpose is in order to provide a government that can meet the needs of union. All means are inferior to their respective ends. Madison and the other Federalists were able to show a majority at the convention that you could not achieve what you needed from a union if you preserve the merely confederal form under which we were governed by the Articles of Confederation. And then one more thing about the Constitutional Convention being a runaway convention. I haven't found a better governing document in the history of the world than the U.S. Constitution. Therefore, I say, if it was the product of a runaway convention, let's have another one. And and quickly, right? And quick. <laughs> yeah, um, but folks, if you do want to check out some more information about that, again, I encourage you to read uh, Dr. Lindsay's uh, wonderful, wonderful piece, and then also check out the conventional disinformation article that we've attached, uh, because that also delves into some of the the issues and the the runaway convention myth and how to address those, particularly if you're talking with people that uh, maybe not be educated may not be educated on this topic. Uh, so, Dr. Lindsay, last question that I have, and then we'll go to some questions from those uh, who have been joining us from home. Uh, as I mentioned before, when I was reading your bio, you served as a commissioner at the Convention of States Foundation simulated Article 5 convention uh, that was held in Colonial Williamsburg this past August. What was that experience like? And did you come away feeling any differently about the convention process than when you first wrote who's, who, the Who's Afraid article? Oh, yeah. I, you know, you can learn things in books and then you can learn them in your bones. 
And when you're involved in the practice, practice of politics, you learned it in your bones. And I went in there very worried because look, uh, everybody there agrees uh, uh, that we need to restrain the government's uh, fiscal uh, authority. They all agree on term limits. They all agree on restricting federal and executive jurisdiction, but they're independent thinkers. And uh, you know what I saw was a lot of different, just as we had at the Constitutional Convention in 1787. But what was so encouraging was that people debated their points, gave their best case, but when it was time to come together, they came together because everyone recognizes that their differences, important as they may be, are far outweighed by what they share in common. And what they share in common is the recognition that we're on the tip of losing America. And so that gave me real hope when we, when we get the other states that we need, that this thing will produce the product we want. Beautiful, beautiful. So folks, if you wanna be involved in the solution big enough to solve the problems, please go on over to conventionofstates.com, click on that take action tab, sign up to become a volunteer, sign up to become a district captain. District captains are one of the most important pieces to convention of states because they focus on building up a team at the district level, work on building relationships with their legislators and constituents are the ones that have the most power in our system. So please go on over to conventionofstates.com, consider becoming a district captain or signing up for a volunteer or in any one of our roles with convention of states. Uh, but now let's go ahead, Dr. Lindsay, and let's answer some of the questions. Oh, I should also point out folks, if you want, you can go on over to uh, our website and see the entire uh, proceedings of the, found, uh, of the COSF simulation. And we also have the proposals that the commissioners decided on available to download. But some of the questions that we got uh, from our audience so far this evening. So Seth wrote in and he asked, how many prominent Democrats have endorsed convention of states? If none, what can we do about that? So Dr. Lindsay, I think I'll answer that question. Uh, and I'll say, Seth, we have not had any prominent Democrats endorse convention of states. But there have been a number of Democrats that had voted in favor of our of our application, including in Alabama when we passed in 2015, I know it was a little while ago, but we had 22 Democrats that voted with us for our resolution in the House alone there in Alabama. And there have been another number of Democrats that have supported us across the country. In addition, we did have uh, a Democrat or two join us at the simulation in Colonial Williamsburg. So there is support out there amongst some Democrats, particularly at the state level, and what can we do about it? Well, I encourage you to go out there and try and have some conversation with some Democrats and encourage them and let them know this isn't about right or left. This isn't about conservative, liberal, Republican or Democrat. It's about we the people against that established elite class in Washington, D.C. that are infringing on our freedoms. And we the people need to stand up and take action. So that's what I would encourage you to do. Dr. Lindsay, I don't know if you'd like to add anything to that. Oh, amen. Amen. All right, so Ronald writes in and he said, what is COS's position on school choice? Should something related to school choice or empowering parents uh, or eliminating the Department of Education be one of the amendments that we propose during our convention once we get to 34 states? So I'll just say Convention of States absolutely supports school, school choice and does support uh, education, freedom and empowering our parents. What do you think, Dr. Lindsay, as someone who is at the simulation uh, I, don't, I don't remember the Department of Education coming up, but what do you think? Should that be one of the amendments that uh, is discussed at a convention? That's an interesting point. Uh, I'm old enough to remember, I mean, the Department of Education was formed by Jimmy Carter the last couple of years of his presidency. Ronald Reagan in 1980 ran on a platform to eliminate the department. He was going to strangle it in its cradle. He couldn't do it. Ronald Reagan, and it hadn't been around very long. Uh, I know that in 1992, one out of every three delegates to the Democratic National Convention was a member of the National Education Association. So you've got some political hurdles. Um, would it take a constitutional amendment? Well, Maybe, you know, a way to approach it would be this way. Chief Justice John Marshall, right? Big friend of big government, right? A student, right? A, a, Alexander Hamilton, he followed Al, Alexander Hamilton. 
Um, both of whom, I mean, both of them would be spinning in their graves of what's being done with the expansion of government today. But in their time, uh, uh, they were for a bigger government. Uh, Marshall said in one of his most famous uh, opinions that he wrote as uh, Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, he said that all matters having to do with health and education are purely the province of the states. So, um, simply restoring the original constitution that and and the states under their police power having control over education that would solve the problem definitely definitely uh so heather uh has a couple of good questions here uh one question she asked was how can we help advance or push school choice in our own state so if, if they're not living in texas what are some of the ways that they could advance the school choice movement in their own state? Listen, give give me a call at, at Texas Public Policy Foundation, and I'll put you in touch with our folks because we've been helping a number of other uh, states that are trying to do the same thing. So you, the good news is you don't have to reinvent the wheel. Uh, there are there are processes, and which we'd be happy to share with you. It'll be a better country when all 50 states have school choice. I love that. That's great. Uh, and I got a note here from one of our, our members of the Pennsylvania team going back to that question about Democrats. They said, could you let people know that Pennsylvania has a primary sponsor in the House who is a Democrat? Well, we just did. So that is awesome. And that, again, goes to show you the type of work that our activists are doing on the ground goes beyond political parties. It, it really does. And that's why it's so important that we try and build relationships with all of our legislators. And we don't just assume, oh, because they're a certain political, they have certain political persuasion or they're of a different party from us uh, that they wouldn't support convention of states. That's right. That's right. Uh, so another question, uh, uh, Heather had another question. Many people are wary of COS and tend to turn away from our cause. How can we convince them that we are an organization of people just like them. Yeah, I would I would be surprised if anyone after a two or three minute explanation remains, quote, wary of the Convention of States. Convention of States is just millions of everyday Americans who uh, are trying to take back the promise uh, that has accounted for millions coming to our shores over these years. So, you know, you saw this uh, typical, uh, similar type of uh, attempted demonization of, you know, Tea Party folks when they're just, right, average everyday people uh, who actually know something about the Constitution and that the federal government's not, uh, not following it. So, you know, I'd be shocked if, if anyone who was worried about COS after seeing what COS stands for, what we're trying to do, of whom we're composed, and how broad the outreach is, uh, I think that would be the best ton tonic to any sort of concerns they would have. Yeah, and I would also say, uh, like, you, like you were saying, Dr. Lindsay, this is a group of fellow Americans that are out there that are trying to preserve the freedoms that our founders put into our, 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 our founding documents. And we've really gotten far away from that. And I think what we're trying to focus on is not only just having a convention, right? That's our goal with Convention of States, but our mission is to grow an army of self-governing grassroots activists, right? Yes. So what that means is, again, like we were talking about earlier and focusing on education, we need to restore self-governance to our society. We, the people, need to reinsert ourselves into this process, and we need to be educated and talking to our legislators. Ultimately, the reason that we have this goal of having that Article 5 convention is we want to take the power away from the federal government and return it to where it should be amongst the states. But the job doesn't end there, right? I often say if we had a convention tomorrow, we got everything we wanted added to that constitution, and I mean everything. Will some things change? Will it fix some things? Yes, absolutely. But it wouldn't fix everything. We no. have to re-engage. We have to be educated. We need to be focused on building those relationships with our legislators because then they are the ones that we need to be going to and holding our their feet to the fire 
it, it yes. doesn't just end at a, after we have a convention. We, the people, have to continue to stay engaged. And that's why it's so important to be a part of the Convention of States movement, because we are doing everything we can to re-educate everyone about their role in our system of governance. Yes. Um, so Gregory asks, can COS call for volunteers to shut the southern border immediately? So <laughs> Gregory, that's a great question. I will note that Convention of States earlier this year uh, was involved in another rally that we had at the Texas Capitol uh, in Austin called the How Many More Rally. And uh, we were supporting that rally. We had a number of activists and uh, great speakers come and talk about the issues at the southern border. I totally agree that this is a major, major issue uh, that our country is facing right now. And in Texas, we did support a bill uh, that would address the issues going on in the southern border. So what I would say to that is, you know, can COS volunteers call to do this? I would say COS volunteers are getting active and trying to pass this important legislation in Texas. So Gregory, if you're in Texas, or even if you're in another border state, I'd encourage you get involved with your team and see if we can advance some important legislation to address this. It's a major problem, but it can't be done without you and me and we the people getting involved and getting engaged. Dr. Lindsay, I don't know if you'd like to add anything about that regarding the southern border. Yeah, no, I, I mean, isn't it? You told somebody 20 years ago, 30 years ago, yeah, there's going to be an invasion on the border and the federal government is both not going to do anything about it and it's not going to allow the states to do anything about it people would say you're crazy well that's what's happened that's what's i mean it's 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 mind-boggling well uh, as the declaration of independence tells us when government becomes destructive of the very ends for which it was established in the first place it's the right of the people to say uh we'll handle it from here and that's so uh the border state, any state, any individual has the right to defend himself, herself, and her fam and their families uh, uh, from uh, from invasion. So it, it's you know it's so frustrating and agonizing that you have a federal government that refuses to do its job and then lies about it. Uh, so I agree with you, uh, telling the uh, our listeners here, if you can get involved in this, it's needed. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. So I, I, we're running short on time, but I think we can squeeze in another two questions here. Uh, John, I live in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. It's gone so far left here. What are the chances and hope for Pennsylvania? Do you know if there is a group working in the state? I'll say, John, yes, there is. And I'd encourage you to go to conventionofstates.com. We do have an area where you can contact your state leadership so you can get connected with our Pennsylvania team. As I mentioned, uh, one of our volunteers, Tracy, was letting me know about what's going on there in Pennsylvania to let you know that there is a Democrat who is a one of our sponsors there in Pennsylvania. So I'd encourage you, get connected with the Pennsylvania team. Go on over to our website to do that. Uh, and then I, we'll, we'll close with this one. Dr. Lindsay, Susan asked, how do you respond to people who don't trust legislators? Uh, and that's why they oppose an Article 5 convention with legislators as commissioners? Well, look, it would be much better if instead of human legislators as commissioners, we put gods in, but that's not gonna happen. So as Matt, you know, as Madison says, right, in, in establishing a government over men, you've also got to uh, uh, be concerned about those who are doing the governing because they're human beings too. That goes with the territory. Um, what you can do is make them state unequivocally and publicly what they're uh, there to do, and you can hold them accountable uh, constantly. As uh, Ronald Reagan said, trust but verify. So I've worked with uh, the Texas legislature uh, since 2011, and um, there are some very, very good people there. Uh, there's no question about it. Now, we also know there are some bad apples. It's human nature. So we've got to have transparency and accountability throughout the process. And most important of all, we've got to uh, stay on them. Absolutely. I want to underscore that too for a minute. I think 
folks think that we we kind of will have commissioners that will go off to uh, the Article 5 convention and then that's it. Well, they're not entering a smoke film room and making these decisions by themselves, right? It's not 1787 anymore where they're going to go off to Philadelphia and we'll find out, you know, months later what happened. No, 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 no. We're going to be involved in this process and we need to make sure that we're holding the commissioners accountable. Like Dr. Lindsay said, that's your job as an activist and that's why you want to be involved with Convention of States. Furthermore, Convention of States is going to be releasing soon some model legislation that we're going to be sharing with all of our states that focuses on uh, commissioner selection and how to keep commissioners faithful to the commissions sent to them by their state legislature. So that will really focus on keeping commissioners uh, on board and not trying to uh, you know, run away, if you will, from the commissions that are given to them by their states. And then it's our job as as the we the people to hold them hold their feet to the fire. So thank you yes. for highlighting that, Dr. Lindsay. I do appreciate it. And folks, we are out of time. So I want to thank all of you who have been answering asking questions and have been enjoying this this webinar. I do feel like we can keep going. There's so many things that we can discuss, uh, but we do have to conclude now. And and if we did not get to your questions, don't worry, we are going to do our best to reach out to you even after the webinar has concluded. We have your email and information, so our team is going to reach out to you. Uh, for those of you who joined late, I do want to address the number one question that we get, which is, was this recorded? And the answer is yes, it was recorded. We do have it available, and we will be providing you with a recording after it finishes processing. And we also have been streaming out on our social media website, so you'll be able to see the recording there as well. Uh, so go ahead and check those out. And again, for those of you who may have missed it at the beginning, usually we announce who our guest is going to be for the next webinar. Uh, we have not gotten our uh, November guest lined up just yet, but we do have a link available for you to register, which I'm dropping in the chat right now. So you can go ahead and register and sign up and join us in November. Um, we will announce who our guest is at a later date. Dr. Lindsay, I just want to thank you again so much for being such a strong supporter of Convention of States, from jo for joining us tonight, and thank you to TPPF as well for being such great partners and supporting Convention of States as well. God bless you, sir. Well, thank you for having me, and as you know, again, let me uh, express my admiration for your organization, for everybody who's listening here. It's it's upon us, right? It's upon this effort that the future of American democracy depends. So thank you for having me. Well said, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you all for taking the time to join us this evening. God bless you, and we'll see you next time. Take care.